We put out a main reserve of 18.9 million tonnes at 1.24% uh, lithium oxide. Um, now the project itself generates some huge um, numbers in terms of economics. So we, we've got an NPV8 of in excess of 1.3 uh, billion. Uh, internal rate of returns uh, at 224%. Hello, welcome to Assay TV. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Len Kolf, who is the interim CEO of Atlantic Lithium. Atlantic Lithium are developing Ghana's first lithium mine. Uh, Len, great to see you uh, here today. Um, if we could start things off, uh, let's talk about the your Iwia project in uh, there in Ghana. As I mentioned, it's this is you're planning this to be lithium uh, Ghana's first lithium mine. Uh, tell us a little bit about the resource you you've delineated there. Sure. Uh, great to be here. Thanks, Leo. And um, yeah, so we've made uh, Ghana's first hard rock spodumene pegmatite discovery right on the Atlantic seaboard uh, and you know, right next door to the N1 highway that takes us to the operating deep sea port of Takaradi. So um, since uh, we commenced drilling back in 2018, uh, we've drilled in excess of uh, 90,000 meters to define the current uh, resource that we used for the PFS, um, and we've just uh, we're in the final phases of completing a thirty-seven thousand meter program, uh, which will lead to a, a resource upgrade hopefully at the end of this year. But um, so the drilling that we've done uh, for the the current resource uh, sits at thirty point one million tons at one point two six percent lithium oxide. So it's a significant hard rock spodumene pegmatite discovery. Mm, excellent. And, and as you mentioned there, you're doing some more exploration, so you're hoping for a, a resource upgrade later in the year. Um, but you've, you've recently put out a PFS. Um, some of the highlight economic numbers um, from that, um, if you could sh share those with us. Sure, yeah. So um, we put out PFS um, uh, last, last week, uh, and it's been a you know, very busy year um, delivering um, that PFS to market. Um, it's delivered some you know, exceptional uh, economics and, and really demonstrates the, the robust nature of this project, notwithstanding when you look at our resource to reserve conversion. Uh, so we, 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 we put out a main reserve of 18.9 million tonnes at 1.24% uh, lithium oxide. Um, now the project itself generates some huge um, numbers in terms of economics. So we We've got an MPV8 of in excess of 1.3 uh, billion uh, internal rate of returns uh, at 224%. Um, and life of mine EBIT does in excess of 240 million per annum. Um, and all of that you know, leads to a um, fantastic payback uh, within five months on capital of the processing plant. So a really robust, solid project. Mm, absolutely. I mean, that five month payback. Uh... Uh, period sort of really does leap out of the numbers there. Um, tell us a little bit in terms of the sort of the cost, the initial startup capital costs. Uh, how's that looking? Yeah, so look, we um, our, our capex costs uh, are sitting now at a uh, hundred and twenty-five million US, um, and that's um, a bit of a change from when we put out our updated scoping study in December. However, the design philosophy has changed significantly from from that scoping study to where we are now with our PFS, notwithstanding the resource uh, grew by an excess of 40% from that scoping study to now our PFS sitting at 30.1 million tons. Um, but so $125 million capex, uh, we bought in all of the primary crushing operations in-house uh, as opposed to um, contracting that as part of the scoping study design. Um, and that, that's quite important, you know, the, the real sensitivity in a DMS only process flow sheet, which is what this project's contemplating, we, we don't need to go to flotation. It's all about um, physical separation through density contrast. So low capex, low opex. Um, but the most sensitive part in that, in that um, processing flow sheet is your primary crushing and trying to minimize uh, lithium losses through fines generation, um, as well as trying to maintain your, your particle size as coarse as possible through that DMS 
flow sheet because it it, it um, enhances or maximizes your recovery. Um, it also gives us some improved um, operating costs through that process flow sheet and, and just keeps it simpler overall. Mm. And you think that keeping it in house uh, is, a, is a better way for you to manage your costs going forward? Yeah. Yeah. Look, the 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 biggest challenge with subcontracting out uh, is a having you know contractors there with the right equipment first and foremost, but b um, those contracts are often targeted around or or structured around productivity. And that's the driving force from a you know contractor to push productivity through that crushing plan. And that's what generates um, increases in fines where you're trying to push that that um, crushing plan to the maximum. Um, and hence you see lithium losses through fines generation as opposed to um, securing those in your spodumene concentrate product at the end of the processing um, flow sheet. Mm. So how are the figures looking in terms of your OPEX? Yeah, so look, our OPEX has um, given us some um, some very good numbers. Um, I just need to remind myself of those looking through our release here now. So C1 cash operating costs of $278 per ton, SE6 free on board. Um, so that um, really demonstrates um, the robust nature of the project. So it's a simple mineralogy through a DMS only process flow sheet. So it's very low in terms of um, consumables. Uh, you're not using any chemicals um, in that process flow sheet, which you would uh, otherwise have to if you're going down flotation. Uh, power consumption is very low, water consumption is very low. And then we're only 800 meters from the national highway, uh, which is then 110 kilometers to an operating deep sea port uh, at Takaradi. So, that all um, um, you know, equates to low operating costs per tonne of SE6 produced. Mm, absolutely. And that, that local infrastructure is important. Is that, I mean, Ghana, obviously a well-established established mining jurisdiction, albeit uh, you know, mainly focused on gold, but, but the infrastructure is there, yeah? Correct, yeah. Look, I mean, Ghana's a fantastic juris jurisdiction, pro-mining jurisdiction. Uh, it's been on the map for, for, for a very long time as a gold destination. Uh, and accordingly, um, there, there's a lot of skilled labor in country um, from right across the value chain in the mining sector. Um, you know, whether you're talking geologists, environmental scientists, mining engineers, process engineers, and all the, the support that goes around that. So um, we're, we're very lucky to be where we are. Uh, there's a ready and available skilled workforce where we are. And given where this project's located, you know, it attracts a lot of interest um, from prospective um, uh, employees who, um, you know, see if they can go and work somewhere where they're much closer to home, being only 100 kilometers to Accra and around some, um, you know, very vibrant communities, Cape Coast, Salt Pond, uh, Mankasim, um, with good schools. So, you know, that really will attract some of the skilled um labor workforce that is currently working in much more remote areas around Ghana or indeed within West Africa. So, um, you know, that, that certainly helps us in that regard. Absolutely. And it must, must be helpful as well that it's a fairly conventional uh, project as well, open pit and a very sort of conventional, straightforward flow sheet, yeah? Yeah, correct. Look, I mean, um, hard rock pegmatite projects, they're essentially, you know, almost like a, a quarrying operation. Um, it, it comes to surface, the pegmatites, and we've got life of mine strip ratios of eight to one. Um, uh, our host rock uh, is, is all a schist and or a granite that's inert. Um, we don't have any associated sulfides, uh, which you often see with um, gold operations. Uh, and accordingly, you don't have any of those acid rock um, drainage issues um, and all of the the um the the engineering design that needs to be put in place to manage that so um that that certainly helps um simplify the project uh, and also in terms of the the actual spodumene concentrate that you produce it's chemically inert uh, we produce um a, a sand byproduct in addition to um feldspar and uh, DSO finds feldspar actually goes into ceramics industry. There is currently a, a ceramics industry local, locally in Ghana within the area where the project is. 
Um, so there's a real opportunity there to, to value add in country in that regard. Um, and um, the DSO finds currently there's a market for that, um, given the huge supply demand issues that we're seeing in, um, in the lithium space currently. Mm. Um, the sand material, um, you know, can go into, into local industry um, in terms of building supplies. So it's a very clean, simple, small footprint project, um, which goes a long way in terms of helping to permit this when you compare it to a, a large throughput gold operation where they're grinding everything right down to, to microns to liberate the gold. Mm, absolutely. I mean, that was going to lead into my next question. Um, so that sort of uh, situation around the project and the simplicity of it must, is, does that help you with your mining lease application that's coming up and your sort of environmental and social impact assessments? Yeah, look, I, I, I believe it will. Um, but, you know, it's the first lithium pegmatite that's been discovered in Ghana, and it's going to be one of the, the, the first operating lithium um, mines within the region. Uh, and accordingly, there's a bit of a learning process to go with that. Um, so, you know, we, we're starting that process now. Uh, and, um, you know, that's an important step to, to, to show those differences between um, what the country's used to in terms of gold operations versus the simplicity of a DMS a hard rock pegmatite operation. Um, but we've got the full support of the government and the full support of our communities to, to push this through that permitting. So we, we're hopeful it's going to be a, a, a very quick process. Mm. What, what are the sort of timelines you're expecting and then timelines towards sort of first production? Well, so for us, uh, our key milestone is submission of our actual mining license application. And now that we've finished our feasibility study, we're, we're able to submit that. Uh, it's then we're looking at in the order of a 12 month timeline for mining license and EPA approval, uh, which is then ratified by government to then allow us to, to break ground on the on the project. Excellent. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit, though, about your, your sort of uh, funding of the project and your relationship with Piedmont uh, Lithium? I um, understand you've got an agreement with them for funding and also for offtake. Correct. Yeah. So. So Piedmont is a joint venture partner and um, they're currently funding us through studies uh, they also hold just under 10% at Topco um, and basically through the agreement that was you know, ratified between us um, approximately a year and a half to two years ago and um, Piedmont uh, are funding us through all those studies uh, to earn into the asset level 22 and a half percent. And once they've funded us through to, to DFS, um, they've then got the option to, to fund up to 70 million US dollars towards CapEx. Uh, once that 70 million dollars has been um, uh, spent on the project, they then earn 50% at the asset level and they'll have rights to 50% of the offtake from the operating mine at uh, market rates. Now, Atlantic maintains control of the project through studies and mining, uh, and um, you know, Piedmont retain 50% of the offtake at, at those market rates I mentioned earlier. Mm, absolutely. And I guess there's no shortage of demand for, for the other 50%. Going forward. Yeah, we, we've been inundated with uh, groups um, for our remaining 50% offtake, which you know, currently is uncommitted. Um, so it's extremely strategic, the, the value of that offtake, um, especially, you know, now you're seeing these growing supply and demand um, um, issues around uh, spodumene concentrate in particular. So, uh, you know, we've been very much focused on delivering the PFS and um, our um, dual listing on the ASX, which we've now done as well. And we've we've finally got some breathing space to decide strategically on on the next steps around our fifty percent offtake. Mm. But um, it's not a time to rush into these things, and we really need to to structure some kind of deal that will add value to our shareholders. Um, given that you know a large chunk of our capital has been funded through our Piedmont agreement. Absolutely. As you just touched on there, it's been a very busy time for the company because you, as well as doing the PFS, you've also just listed on the ASX. Um, what was the sort of rationale behind that? Look, um, the company is domiciled in Australia already. So I'm Brisbane based and the corporate head office is in Sydney. Our study team is in Perth. And um, 
over a third of our existing shareholders are domiciled here in Australia since the, the company IPO'd back in 2014. Um, at that time, the company was called Iron Ridge Resources. It had a grassroots iron ore project in Gabon in West Africa. And, and that kind of story was a lot more favorable to, to the AIM and London space as opposed to here on the ASX and hence, hence why the company listed on AIM. But now, you know, given um, the fact we're domiciled here, a large portion of our shareholders are Australian. It, it kind of made sense to, to, to get that secondary listing here on the ASX, notwithstanding some of the valuations we're seeing amongst our peers here on the ASX. So Australia likes uh, the lithium space um, and it, it made sense to, to, to list the company uh, to have that dual listing on the ASX. Mm. And how did that go, the launch on the ASX? Yeah, look, um, it was um, um, a, a, a tough week to, to list on the ASX, um, but we held our grand uh, and we closed on par with opening price and we've subsequently um, lifted, uh, ra raised in terms of our, um, our, our uh, share price to what we listed on. So performance has, has been good uh, in the current macro market economics. Um, so... Yeah, we're pleased with that. And now we've got the foundation to, to really start to um, promote and show this story within the Australian investment sector and continue to do that with our very you know, strong and loyal UK uh, retail and investment sector. Excellent. So going forward for the rest of uh, the year, what are the sort of key milestones that people should be looking out for? Well, um, we've, um, you know, we're in the final stages of completing the 37,000 meter drilling program that I mentioned earlier. Um, now two thirds of that meterage was designed for infill. So to, to increase confidence, uh, um, to convert our remaining inferred to indicated, as well as converting our first one and a half to two years of indicated to measured. Um, so that will all lead um, you know, through to a resource upgrade at the end of this year. And in addition to those two thirds of the meters are assigned to increasing confidence in resource. A third of that meterage was assigned to resource growth outside of the current resource footprint. So that's trying to add more tons to the current resource uh, of 30.1 million tons. And we have announced some you know, pretty exciting results outside of the current resource footprint, including highs of uh, 69 meters at 1.34%. So, we're expecting to see um, a resource upgrade uh, and all of that drilling. We'll, we'll see continuous news flow between now and the end of the year and hopefully a resource upgrade at the end of this year, which will feed into the, the next round of studies. Excellent. Well, we look, at, look forward to, to seeing that and hopefully you can come back and uh, tell us all about it when you've got the resource upgrade coming out. Um, but thank you very much, Alain, for joining us today and telling us all about Atlantic Lithium. No, great to be here and thanks uh, for the, the time. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much.